Now let's move into the digestive system. So we'll start off with the esophagus, and I'm just going through the structures that you will see in the cadaver lab, of course. We know that we would put food first into your oral cavity that would move back into your oropharynx and then into your laryngopharynx, which brings it down into your esophagus at this point. So we move that posteriorly to the heart, pierce the diaphragm, and at that point where we have the opening for the esophagus, that is called your esophageal hiatus, and that brings it down into your abdominal cavity. So this is a cadaveric view of what your esophagus would look like. So you could see our trachea over here. It has been moved a little bit laterally in order for us to see the full extent of your esophagus. And you could really see the striated muscle when you're in lab of this. So if you first were to dissect uh, your abdominal cavity, you would see this large sack um, of fat. And you'd be wondering, where are all the intestines? Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to all of this in here. This is called your greater omentum. And it attaches to what we'll soon learn is the greater curvature of the stomach. So. Um, most, this is just another view of your uh, greater omentum. Um, and then of course we have a lesser omentum and that is attaching to the lesser curvature of your stomach over here. So um, most of the cadaveric pictures beyond this point will not have that omentum in place. So let's continue the pathway of food. We stopped at the esophagus and now we are looking at a view of our stomach. So where the esophagus joins the stomach is called your cardiac opening, um, also known as your lower, or to contain your lower esophageal sphincter. And from this opening, if we were to draw a line across to the lateral side of the stomach, that would um, create this dome shape on top of the stomach. And anytime we see a dome, portion on an organ, we call that the fundus. It just looks like so much fun, you just want to jump on there. And then the main mass of the stomach is called the body, and the inferior portion is known as the pyloric zone. The word pyloric or pylorus refers to gatekeeper, and that is because we have a muscle here called the pyloric sphincter, and when it contracts, it closes off the stomach entrance of contents into the intestines and so it is gatekeeping at that point and of course when it relaxes it will allow the contents of the stomach to move into the first part of the the small intestines if we look at an internal view of the stomach we could see that we have these folds called rugae or we could just call them gastric folds and sometimes let me go back to this over here Sometimes we can have some erosion take place on, in this mucosa of the rugae and get an ulcer um, due to high acidity within the stomach or if we um, have some of the contents of the stomach move into the duodenum and we are not able to neutralize the acidic contents of the stomach that could cause a duodenal ulcer as well. So back to our rugae or gastric folds. Um, this always makes me think of reggae music because when you listen to reggae, you're just like waving your body, your arms around, and that's exactly what these folds look like. They're just wavy lines all around, and this is because we need to increase our surface area within the stomach. So here are some images from APR of these structures. We have your esophagus, the cardiac opening here, the dome-shaped fundus, the main mass or the body of the stomach and the pylorus and at this point from the stomach we are going to move into the first part of the small intestines which is called your duodenum actually before that let's point out the relationship over here to other organs so here is your stomach okay and you'll see in some cadavers this might be much larger and then we have the liver in the left upper quadrant. So we did not discuss the curvatures just yet. 
On the left portion of the stomach, we have this greater curvature that we said the greater omentum will attach to. And then on the lesser curvature, which would be the right side of the stomach, would be the lesser curvature, which would serve as an attachment for the lesser omentum. This is a nice cut through the pylorus so that you could see that pyloric sphincter um, before we head into the duodenum. And we may have a stomach that is cut open for you to see those gastric folds or rugae. So another um, structure to point out on the small intestines is this portion in green here that almost looks like fat when you first look at it. That is your mesentery. And the mesentery is formed by your parietal and visceral peritoneum. And in there we have vessels coursing, um, whether they're arteries, veins, and they could also be lymphatic vessels as well. And we have already looked at these structures uh, within our vasculature lecture. Um, or structures within the lab. So the, most of the mesentery has been dissected away, but I'm sure we can still find some bodies that have it intact. So you could see here's the vasculature at this point going to the intestines and the mesentery, of course, in this image is not um, depicted. So let's go over the three parts of the small intestines. We have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. So first we'll discuss the duodenum. It has four different parts. The first part indicated by the number one is called your superior part and this is going to be the area where duodenal ulcers are most likely to occur because of its proximity to the stomach. So if you have a faulty pyloric sphincter that isn't able to contract and have full closure we might get a leakage of some of the contents of the stomach or too much of the um, gastric juice is coming into the duodenum that could cause a duodenal ulcer. The, oh my numbering is off here, so this number one should actually be a two. This is your descending part of the duodenum and this is going to have an opening here called the major duodenal papilla. Sometimes we even have a minor duodenal papilla here that will allow the bile and pancreatic juices to come into the duodenum to help neutralize the acidic contents in here and also to emulsify fats. And then our horizontal part should be a number three here. So this is the horizontal part. And lastly, we have, this should be a number four for our ascending part that is moving up. So the duodenum is pretty short and notice how the duodenum is cradling what we will soon know is called the head of the pancreas. So the pancreas is kind of like its little baby that it's, it's cradling. So what does this look like in a cadaver? So here's my stomach over here and this would be that um, pyloric sphincter that was cut and here's the first part of the duodenum or the superior part. We're moving down here. There's our descending part, the horizontal part, and then our ascending part, moving a little bit up. And of course, this would be the head of the pancreas here that the duodenum is cradling. And beyond this ascending part, this would be the jejunum. So the jejunum, the way you will identify this in the cadaver lab is that it would be in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. I will place a portion of the intestines there and that is how you will identify it. Now let's take a closer look of, at the duodenum here. In this dissection they have cut through the duodenal wall and you can see an opening here. This would be your major duodenal papilla, again allowing um, bile and pancreatic juices to move into the duodenum and then sometimes we will have this minor duodenal papilla that will um, allow pancreatic juices into the uh, duodenum as well. So this is just a overall view of the intestines. Again here is our jejunum in the upper left quadrant or left upper quadrant. Um, 
and then your ilium is going to travel on down and basically most of it the way i will test you on this in the cadaver lab is you should find your ilium in the right lower quadrant because most likely the area I will pin it will be right before it enters the large intestines at the area of the cecum. We can also see some mesentery over here and here's the root of the mesentery. So next we'll talk about the large intestines. You could see the ileum is entering the large intestines over here. We would call this the ileocecal junction and um, allow contents to move into the first part of the large intestines, which is called the cecum. So the cecum means, a, means blind because this is a blind pouch and will continue to move the contents up into the ascending colon. But you may have noticed this little tail that looks like is hanging off of the cecum. This is called your vermiform appendix. Vermiform means worm. So anatomists thought this looks like a little worm hanging off of the cecum, but it is a lymphatic organ because we find some lymphatic tissue within here. It may be missing in some of our cadavers. Um, most likely they had appendicitis and it was removed. So here is an image of our large intestines. You could see the ileum traveling into the cecum here, our nice blind pouch, and you could see quite a nice large appendix hanging off of the cecum here. So the next area we'll explore is the ascending colon. So we move into the ascending colon. So if you trace the right side of your abdomen moving superiorly, this is where your ascending colon would be, then we're gonna see that it will bend. And so we're going to call this the hepatic flexure or the right colic flexure. We call it the hepatic flexure because this is going to be found inferior to the liver. And then it will travel over toward the left side of the abdomen. Um, this is a retroperitoneal structure, so you'll find it pretty um, posteriorly. And so the transverse colon will travel over to the left and bend again, so we are gonna call this the splenic or the left colic flexure. Splenic because we find it inferior to the spleen. So this is a cadaveric image of those portions of the colon. We left off at the cecum. Here's our ascending colon on the right side of our abdomen. This would be our right colic or hepatic flexure, and then our transverse colon moving across over to the left side. Now at that point, we had that bend, the splenic flexure, and now the large intestines is traveling inferiorly, so we are gonna call this the descending colon, and it is found on the left side of our abdomen. It is then gonna form a loop, so this is called your sigmoid colon, and I always remember this because the loopiness reminds me of the letter S, so I think sigmoid. And at that point, it goes straight down, and we know the word rectus or rectum means straight, so this is nice and easy to remember. So here's our left colic or splenic flexure, turning into the descending colon. Then we see that nice little loop that it does. This is our sigmoid colon, and down into the rectum it goes. So I wanted to give you some of the features that we expect to find on the large intestines. You might find some fat hanging off of the colon, and these are called epiploic appendages or omental appendages. The function of these are unknown, and you'll see in certain cadavers, they will have either a lot of them, or it'll look like they have no appendages. Um, so just keep that in mind. Then you'll also see this these small pouches of the colon, and these are called hostra, for plural, hostrum for sing singular. And then you'll see, um, we're gonna talk about the different layers of your um, digestive system. Um, and so one of the layers is called muscularis externa. And in there, we would expect to find two layers of smooth muscle. One is a circular layer and one is a longitudinal layer. And so on the large intestines, the longitudinal layer is incomplete. And so instead we get these tenier coli that are formed. 
Now let's move into some of our accessory organs of our digestive system, starting with the liver. So this is an anterior view, and we have four lobes of our lung. So the right lung, right lobe, excuse me, being the largest. So here's our right lobe, this would be our left lobe. And to see the other lobes, we would have to look at an inferior view of the liver. So this is an inferior view. You could see the right lobe on the right, left lobe on the left. And over here we have this square shaped lobe. So this is called your quadrate lobe. Quad meaning four sided. And this is gonna be found more anteriorly. So I always think Q and A, quadrate anterior. The other one will be this tail like lobe. So they call this your caudate lobe. Caudate, of course, means tail. And the tail is found posteriorly, so that makes sense. We also have to know two ligaments on your liver. We have your falciform ligament. So you'll find this between the right and left lobe. And it, will, it basically um, attaches the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. So it's just shooting like through your screen. Imagine your screen is the abdomen, the anterior abdomen. So it's just attaching it there. And within this falciform ligament, if you continue down inferiorly, in this region, we will find the round ligament. And the round ligament within its free edge will contain an obliterated umbilical vein. So this used to be your lifeline at one point when you were a fetus. I'm sure you remember those days. So then over here, outlined in teal, and the superior aspect of the liver, we have the coronary ligament. Remember, coronary means crown, so this is kind of like the crown on top of the liver. And this is attaching the liver to the diaphragm. We can also see the gallbladder from the inferior aspect of the liver, um, sitting between the right lobe and the quadrate lobe. This gallbladder is going to store and concentrate the bile that the liver makes. So this is a cadaveric view of, it, of the inferior aspect of the liver. We see the right lobe on the right, left lobe on the left, caudate lobe posteriorly, and your quadrate lobe, this is kind of a little bit um, small com compared to some of the cadaveric ones we'll see in the lab. Um, this is your quadrate lobe, and then this tissue here is your gallbladder. Um, and then so over here we would see the fissure of your round ligament that we just discussed as well. Okay, so just wanted to show you a different view of this falciform ligament. Um, here it is over here. Again, if we had our anterior abdominal wall here, it would attach the liver to that. And then you will see a thickened portion on this free edge that would be your round ligament that contains the obliterated umbilical vein. So if we look um, a bit more inferior to the liver, we could see some structures that belong to an area called the porta hepatis. So We've discussed the blood vessels in this region. You should be familiar with your celiac trunk and your common hepatic artery branching over here. And it becomes your hepatic artery proper and then turns into your right hepatic artery and left hepatic artery. Now located laterally to this, um, you will find your bile duct. So the liver would create the bile, the gallbladder here is storing and concentrating it, and then they can secrete the contents into the bile duct. So we're going to talk about the duct system in just a moment. Um, the other thing that we can find more posterior to these structures is the hepatic portal vein, that nutrient-rich deoxygenated blood would be, um, would be draining from your superior mesenteric vein and inferior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein over to um, the hepatic portal vein. So now let's talk about the pancreas. We said that the head is cradled by the duodenum. The body would transverse the vertebrae, 
so we would find the vertebrae posterior to this. And then the tail is going to point over to the spleen. The spleen we will find in your left upper quadrant. So here's a cadaveric image of that. Here is our duodenum, and then the head of the pancreas is here. This would be the body, and then the tail at this um, lateral portion. And here is our spleen in that left upper quadrant. So just a quick note on the spleen, although we'll discuss its many functions, but one of its main roles is it's going to remove old red blood cells and hold a reserve of blood for us. And just another view of that spleen in the upper, in the uh, left upper quadrant. So next let's talk about our duct system. Our duct system is really assisting us in bringing bile and pancreatic juices into the duodenum. So we know that the liver is going to create or synthesize our bile. And the way it's bringing it down is through these right and left hepatic ducts. These ducts are going to come together to create what's known as the common hepatic duct. So we're draining bile from the liver at this point. But we also said that bile is going to be stored and concentrated within the gallbladder. So we have to have a duct there too, of course. So that is going to be called the cystic duct. So that drains the gallbladder itself. Now when the cystic duct comes together with the common hepatic duct, it becomes the common bile duct. And that will eventually lead to, um, to drain into the duodenum here. Now the other duct that, it's actually this back in here, but it's represented by the black line, is your main pancreatic duct. And this is going to bring in those pancreatic juices from the pancreas into the duodenum. And this is just a nice illustration of that duct system once again. So what would this be called here? This would be your ha common hepatic duct. And this one here, well, the label's there on that one, but that's going to be your cystic duct. And then here, we would have your common bile duct because your common hepatic duct came together with your cystic duct to create this common bile duct. And then this here would be your main pancreatic duct. And so you could see in this image that this common bile duct is merging with this main pancreatic duct and will lead to the major duodenal papilla. Now sometimes we will also have an, an, another branch off of this main pancreatic duct that will deliver the pancreatic juices through a minor papilla or minor duodenal papilla. So this is what it looks like in a cadaver. Here we have your right hepatic duct and your left hepatic duct draining the liver. That becomes your common hepatic duct. Then we have the cystic duct draining the gallbladder, and when that comes together with this common hepatic duct, it becomes the common bile duct. I think that's a little difficult to see where they come together here after it changes its name because that cystic duct is so posterior. Um, here's your bile duct, and coming together with the main pancreatic duct, and then of course in here we would have that major duodenal papilla.